Thank you. So I, I wasn't aware of what kind of introduction. I'm not a public speaker. I really am not. Um, I'm a storyteller. And the story works best when I'm interrupted and people ask questions. And uh, I, I am anything but a lecturer. So it, it's, it's important. I wasn't 100% sure, so I kind of put together a little agenda, kind of introduce myself, uh, talk a little bit about our company, I'll uh, just give you an overview of, of the industry as I see it. Um, talk a little bit about the evolution of hotels in America. I have a feeling you may know more about that than I do. Um, talk some about current hotel trends. There you go. Talk some about current hotel trends um, and what I see. I, I have to include Marriott's impact on the industry. Um, I know that Marriott is, is, I grew up with Marriott in, in the Washington DC area. My first date was in a Marriott restaurant. So, um, so Steve and I share that in common, the love for that company. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about what the distributor's role is because that's what we are. And maybe just some considerations that you might make if you're looking for a supplier. But most importantly, stop me anytime. Just shout out, raise your hand, whatever. Um, ask questions, because I did not intend this to be, uh, I'm not gonna sit here and read you slides. Um, I, I, I hate that when somebody does it, and I'm not gonna do it to you, so. I, so just a personal history, and I appreciate the introduction. The only reason I put 1944 on there, that was the beginning of what's now called the baby boomer. But it also explains why I have to sit down, because at 74 years old, I'm not real good at standing up so long anymore. So what? Yes? Sure. I'm trying. How's that? Better? Yeah. All right, good. So we'll leave it there. Um, I started working in 1957. Uh, I was 13 years old. Uh, my grandfather had a, a produce and poultry business. And again, I, I said Marriott's wrapped up in my whole life in this business because Marriott was our largest customer. Uh, my grandfather and, and Mr. Marriott um, knew each other well. As a matter of fact, there was a point in time where business was not so good and, and um, we needed uh, money, we had the payroll to make, and we were short on cash, and my grandfather called Mr. Marriott, and I drove him up to pick up a check from Mr. Marriott himself to help us fund our payroll that week. So, uh, goes back a long, long time. 1963, I joined the Marine Corps Reserves. Um, hoorah for anybody who doesn't know that one. Uh, in 1968, I sold my business, or my grandmother sold the business, I didn't. My grandfather passed away. I started a little food service brokerage business. And that business is very interesting because manufacturers who manufacture product or package product often don't employ their own sales force, they employ brokers who represent them. So. Uh, in those days, I represented about 14 different companies, um, frozen food companies, canned good companies, um, even a couple of fresh produce companies. Then in 1976, um, I moved to I. Feldman and Company in Washington, D.C. Uh, Feldman was, at the time, the premier distributor to uh, restaurants, hotels uh, in Washington. Um, and again, Marriott was our largest customer, but they were also an important supplier because they had built a, an operation called Fairfield Farms Kitchens. And they, um, they produced a number of items for their hot shop restaurants. And we sold those items to other customers. It was really a, a, an interesting arrangement. In 1986, we sold that company to Kraft Foods. Um, I worked with Kraft for uh, three years, learned a lot about mayonnaise and French dressing. Um, 
And then in 1989, I purchased a small distribution company in Richmond, Virginia that I sold 11 years later. And as you heard earlier, I quote retired and, and started a little consulting practice. And actually, Frank Hotta, who was the second generation of the Hotta family, called me and asked me if I would come here and take a look at his company. And I had been to Hawaii once before, many years before. Um, and for between 2004 and 2012, I would come two or three weeks at a time, three or four times a year, and I just fell in love with this place. Uh, I hope, I know many of you folks from all over the world, um, just driving up here uh, and, and seeing the beauty, the natural beauty that God's given us here on this place. It's a very special place. So I, I, I you know, anyway, in 2012, as you heard, I joined the company full time. So that's kind of me. Um, our company's 105 years old. We started, the company started in Hilo. Um, in, in the early 1900s, Hilo was the capital of the, the uh, territory of Hawaii. And it's where almost all of the Japanese um, immigrants uh, landed and started businesses. Uh, if, you, if you are familiar with Hilo, uh, right on the waterfront, or the front street, is a building called S. Hata, and that was Yoichi Hata's brother who started in the, in the clothing business at the same time Yoichi Hata started in the, uh, in the food business. So in 1938, the company opened on Oahu. Today, um, third generation of management and ownership. Uh, Russell Hata is the grandson of, the, of Yoichi. Uh, we have three or uh, five locations, soon to be seven. We're in the process of acquiring another business now um, that uh, in the same industry, but leaning more to a slightly different side of products than what we carry now. We service 800 plus customer locations. We carry 16,000 different products. We have about 400, I think today it's 404. We're just, just went over 400 employees. Our annual sales are about $325 million. And we serve all segments of the hospitality industry, uh, independent and chain restaurants, hotels, caterers. We've been the supplier to the United States military in Hawaii since 1997. Um, and that, as, as some of the folks who've been on the field trips, I hope, have seen, that contract with the military demands a level of sanitation, cleanliness, food security that makes us a very unusual company in the state of Hawaii. Uh, we service DOE and public schools across the entire state uh, and many private schools. Um, and. Uh, we do a little bit of business in the healthcare side. The products for healthcare are a little bit different, and um, we're not real big in that healthcare segment. But the commercial side um, and the, the military the schools, uh, we, we kind of dominate the. the uh, yeah. So it's, uh, it's an interesting business. We are the largest in Hawaii. Um, no real prize comes with being large, but. Um, uh, it, it, but it does give us some resources to serve our customers better than than um, than, uh, than we would have otherwise. So what, let's talk about the industry for a minute. What is our industry? You know, and, and food. There's two ways food are consumed. Food food is food is either bought in a supermarket to be eaten at home, or bought in a restaurant to be eating eaten on the premises. Two years ago, for the first time in the history of the United States, more food was bought in restaurants than was bought in grocery stores. For, for, for many, many years, I remember when food for restaurants, or food away from home as it's called, uh, was about 18% of the total, and 82% of the total was food eaten at home. Today, it's 51% away from home and 50% or 49% at home. 
So that's been a huge change. And if you ever get into Honolulu and walk around Waikiki or, or any, or Kaka'ako, and you see the numbers of new restaurants, it's just amazing. Uh, however, there's a downside that we have a few closing too, because, uh, but that's a constant, it, all of my life I've seen that, um, that cycle continue. New places open, old places that don't keep up, close. Um, it doesn't worry me at all. Our credit manager has some tr struggles with it from time to time, but, but, but that's all. So, you know, a, a meal away from home, I mean, either in a restaurant, right here in school, breakfast, meals in a hospital, and then a hotel. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about hotels because the diversification of food in hotels today is another thing that's just exploded. And whether it's a, a Marriott Marquis or whether it's a, a, a courtyard, um, the, the way that food's presented today is so different than it was um, 15, 20 years ago. So the fact is that food service is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Our whole lives revolve around eating. And uh, if more than half of the dollar is spent away from home, then our role as the supplier of those products uh, continues to grow and, uh, and become more important. But we're just the back of the house. We're not, I, I, one of my favorite sayings is we've got $22 million worth of food stored in the state of Hawaii, but we don't have any tables or chairs. So we rely on our customers. Our relationship with our customers becomes symbiotic almost, that we have to understand them and what they're trying to do if we're gonna be successful doing what we do. So we become part of their business. Small part, but a part of their business. And finding the right product for them at the right cost, the right quality level, uh, that's what our people do. Our chefs do that. Um, our salespeople do that. Uh, we have category managers who do it. Um, it. It's just so important to find, I mean, all of you have experienced what you consider a good eating experience and one that's not so good. Um, that could be because the quality of the product that's bought is not what it should be, but it also could be because it wasn't prepared right or, or whatever. So. Um, you know, finding the right product is so important. If, if, you're, if somebody wants to sell french fries and they don't have a fryer, but we sell them fries that they need a fryer for instead of fries they can do in the oven, then you're not gonna get a french fry from them. So those are the kinds of things that we have to understand uh, about the, the, the business. Hotels. The first recorded inn in history in America was built in 1607 in Jamestown, Virginia. Um, and then the colonial period, Jamestown was the first permanent English settlement in the United States. Um, and they, they were there for just a few weeks and somebody opened a, 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 an inn at the time. Um, during the colonial period, you had inns and taverns, um, and they came mostly along the rivers and, and the roads uh, because that's where people were. You know, people in those days traveled by horse and buggy. There were no trains yet. There were no, certainly no cars yet. Uh, but they, carried, they traveled by boat or they traveled by car or by uh, a horse. So these things started to spring up along those routes. Hotels then later started first on the East Coast, first in New York City, and hotels started to grow around ports of embarkation where people were coming from foreign country and they needed a place to stay. And then as the cities grew, New York of course being the, the first, I can't remember, I can't remember the name of the first hotel in New York, I don't remember, but that kind of started um, what we say. And then they started following the stagecoach westward. 
think about that. Again, travel to the West was all done in stagecoach. So restaurants and, and inns and, and even hotels started following the stagecoach route and then railroad stops. When railroads became um, prominent, when, when railroads became the primary means of transportation between cities and one side of the country to the other, there was a fellow by the name of Fred Harvey who developed terminal restaurants, restaurants in the railroad terminals, and that was really a pioneering move in, in, the, uh, uh, in the beginning of, of what we now see as the total hospitality industry. So Fred Harvey was a, was a real uh, pioneer. And then we started seeing luxury properties come because all of a sudden in the cities, people wanted to have parties and meetings. <coughs> so we saw that start to happen. And then Mr. Statler in the 20th century realized that there were, the only hotels that existed at the time were high-priced properties. So Mr. Statler came in and, and uh, created this whole mid-range level of hotels that later was sold to Hilton. When I was a kid, Hilton was Statler Hilton. It wasn't just Hilton, it was Statler Hilton. So that started to spring up. And then in the 1990s, we saw motor ends, or 1950s rather, we saw motor ends and travel course, Howard Johnson's. I just read a book about the most, the, the 10 most influential people in America in the food industry, and Howard Johnson's was one of those 10, because Howard Johnson's was really the first chain restaurant. And uh, he, he worked, it had an orange roof, Back when I grew up, there was a hot shop by Marriott on one side of the street and a Howard Johnson's on the other side of the street. Um, that really started to change the whole way. All of a sudden, people had cars, they started traveling. And incidentally, in 1957, Marriott opened their first uh, motor hotel, it was called, uh, just outside of Washington, D.C., just across the river from Washington. Um, I've got a picture of that, actually, uh, later. That hotel became my mother's favorite place to eat. And there, there was a restaurant in that hotel called Allie's, A-L-L-Y-S, I guess. No, no, A-L-L-I-E-S. And that was Mrs. Marriott's first name, Alice. So we would go there on Sundays after church. My mother just didn't want to go anyplace else. And it was not at all uncommon to see Mr. and Mrs. Marriott there eating. Now, I'm not talking about Bill, who's now running the company. I'm talking about his dad. It was not at all uncommon to see them there eating and, and greeting their customers. And uh, it was really a, an amazing thing. 1990s, when air travel started to boom, and that's when the, the real, the industry, the late 80s, early 90s is when the industry really started to bloom. Um, then 2001, when that terrible event happened, there was certainly a downturn. People stopped traveling uh, for a while. Um, and that's when hotels started leasing restaurants. A restaurant in a hotel was, I don't know if a restaurant in a hotel was ever a real money maker for the hotel. Um, the restaurant was necessary because they had people and they had to feed them and there weren't a lot of other restaurants around. But by the, by the 2000s, beginning of the 2000s, the restaurants became um, really a, a drag sometimes on the hotel. So they started leasing restaurants to independent operators. And if you look around Hawaii, uh, there are a number of hotels where the restaurant uh, is owned by a restaurant operator, not, not by the hotel. They pay rent to the hotel, and the hotel makes more money from the rent than they did when they operated the restaurant. However, the meeting, the banquet, the catering business in the hotel is still very, very important. If you look at the food cost in a restaurant, a restaurant spends about 38% of their sales, to, or 35% maybe, to buy food. 
hotel banquet business, the cost is about 22%. So there's a huge difference between those two. And uh, the banquet business is very important to hotels. Today, <laughs> there's so much diversification in the industry. I mean, as you know, Marriott and Starwood just merged. I don't know, is Hilton the largest now, or is that new company the largest? I'm not sure. They're both behemoths. Well, the new company, the very Starwood says they're the largest. They're the largest. They have approximately 6,200 hotels. Whoa. Worldwide. How many different brands do you think they have? Uh, they have? They have over 30. Over 30 different brands in one company. And why do they do that? Because they're different price points, different styles, different. It's amazing to me. I, I'm a frequent traveler in New Orleans. I love New Orleans. There are, there's four, one place in New Orleans on four corners. Three of those four corners have a Marriott property, but they're all different. And they're all busy. And they all attract a certain me. I'm a courtyard person. but. People, Spring Hill Suites is over here, and, and uh, Residence Inn is over here, and I, I, it's just amazing to me. And that's true throughout the country today. So I, I have no idea how many brands in total of hotels there are, uh, because Hilton's done a lot of their, um, I call it stratification, I guess it's a fancy word. So. What are the trends today? The, the trends, as, as I see them, is, 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 and particularly for hotels, but some of it's true for restaurants as well. Healthy food, fast food, global, the explosion of, of Thai and Asian cuisine, and, and um, gosh, we just had an Ethiopian restaurant open in Honolulu. Uh, so African and, and, and Asia and, and uh, just global everything, clean menus. Nobody wants, it, it's very important now um, that things be G, G, GMO free and all that kind of thing. Allergy aware, uh, eco social, close to home, local. That becomes very, very important today in the industry. And, and people who are in the business um, really have to deal with all of those issues in one way or another. And we do our best to train our staff to help them work through some of those issues. Um, delivery. I call it the Amazoning, or the Uberization of, of the restaurant business. And in restaurants, that becomes an additional revenue stream. In hotels, that becomes a challenge. Because if they had an outlet there that sells food, now their customer has a choice of getting Uber to deliver something to them. So that takes revenue away from the hotel. Uh, so it's a two-sided thing. The restaurant loves it. Well, most of them love it. Uh, but the hotel doesn't like it so much. So it, it's, it's an interesting conundrum. That also leads to a total revolution in how food is packaged. And if I turn the clock back 20 years ago, we may have had we may have had 20 different choices in how somebody would pack food to go. Today, we probably have 300 different choices of how they pack food to go, and that's just because of the rise of that delivery, take home and delivery business. It, it, it's it's just amazing to me. Hotels, restaurants have to stand on their own. If, they, if the hotel owns the restaurant, it has to stand on its own. Uh, and depending on the type and location of property, I and mean, if, if you've got a hotel out in the middle of nowhere, chances are they've got a pretty well-developed food service program. But if they're in the middle of a city, uh, they probably don't. Again, with the exception of that bank with a needing business, which is very important to them. Um, Little mainstream in the hotel restaurants. There's lots of extremes. You have Starbucks or you have destination restaurants. The destination restaurants are usually the ones that are leased to uh, a prominent restaurant operator. But 
I go to courtyard, I stay in courtyards a lot, and what courtyards doing now to try to increase their food business through their, I mean, it's almost like a mini food court. Um, it, it just continually, they're, they're continually finding ways, uh, probably to battle that delivery business some, but to make it fast and convenient and healthy uh, for the people staying in the hotel. Again, self-operated or leased. And banquet meetings are not. Courtyards, well, courtyards now are in the meeting business too. <clears throat> but uh, some of the lower or, or less costly concepts, cheaper concepts, uh, they don't do meetings. They're, they're simply a, a place to sleep. Uh, but so there's an endless variety. And every single one of those differences is something that we learn to deal with, we learn to help the customer deal with, and as, as you, if you are headed into that business, um, the, the, the little idiosyncrasies of every one of those differences becomes very important to your bottom line uh, to, to learn to deal with them. Again, in a hotel, you've got restaurants, you've got breakfast, you've got room service, you have receptions, you've got all these different kinds of, all of them require different expertise, all of them require, I mean, there are some basics, but all of them require something a little different. And to the person going into the food side of, of hotel management, um, this becomes a challenge because some hotels, every one of these things applies in one way or another. So it's, it's a very, very, it's not as simple as it looks, I guess, is, is, is what, I, what I'm saying. Um, I've talked about Marriott, and I, I have to, I have to, to just share this with you. The, the first picture up on, on um, my left, I guess it would be your right, is, is a picture of the original hot shop uh, in 1927. And I don't know whether you know the story or not, and, and it may not be important to you, but you know, Mr. and Mrs. Marriott came from Utah to Washington and opened an A&W root beer stand. And you lost your Oh, well, that's a beautiful picture. What did I do? This is not my laptop, so I don't know. Oh, there we go, okay, oh, there we go. So if you look on, on the left-hand side, that's the first, and then in 1936, they started curb service, because that's when cars started coming around. Uh, that, that picture on the, on the top right is Mr. Marriott in a helicopter. That was actually on the site of where the first motor hotel was, because he was an innovator in creating in-flight catering. That was a huge part of the business in those days because every seat on every airplane had a meal. Not so anymore, but, but it was in those days. Um, the car hop would bring you out, you had a tray, you put it on the side of the car. Again, I have to tell you, that's where my first date was. In, in that, actually, on the next slide, I'll show you the exact hot job where my first date was because I remember it very, very well. Um, <laughs> And that's, that's Bill Marriott. Um, he was staying in front of the first motor lodge, or uh, motor hotel, I guess it was called, um, giving directions to somebody as to how to get into the property. Uh, again, I absolutely. That was my first assignment, the Twin Bridges Marriott Hotel. Was it really? And it was interesting, when that hotel was built in 1957, the concept was kind of like a toll booth. You would drive up in your car, roll your window down, you would check in, and they would tell you which of the seven buildings to drive to. So then you would drive through your room and you would check in at the front desk, which was kind of the toll booth. You know what's interesting about that is that I, when you were saying that, I remembered that they used to accept my ESO gas credit card for payment. Yeah, I mean, it, it, so it, it, was, it was amazing. Again, that was my mother's favorite place to eat. And then what I, what I really, what I didn't know, and, and it's ironic, is the 100th Hotel opened here in Hawaii. I did not know that until I, I started doing a little, little more research. 
Uh, so if, if you look, again, I hope I'm not boring you with, with the Marriott stories, but it's just such a part to understand this industry in the United States and not on, particularly on the East Coast and not understand the role of Marriott, uh, you're missing something. Uh, you're missing quite a bit. That's Mr. Marriott in front of the hot shop. I don't know where Big Mac thinks they originated something because that was, that was the mighty mo, and that was a daggone good sandwich, and that was long before anybody knew anything about a Big Mac. Um, I mean, it really was. And then that picture on the right was my favorite dessert, a hot fudge cake. That was just a wonderful creation. Uh, and that was, that was a hot job. If you look down in the, the right, you'll see, well, you can't really see it very well, but that's, those are the trays. So you pull up in your car, you push a button, you give your order to somebody on the other side, and it would be delivered to your car. And I can tell you that, again, many, many, many first dates were in those slots because that's, that was the thing to do. And uh, uh, it was actually very interesting because at night they would have to block some of it off because cars would keep going around in circles all the way around, 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 trying to, to grab the attention of a car full of girls. The guys would be going around. So they, they finally had to block off so you couldn't do that anymore because it, it was interesting. That was the menu. Um, and I didn't have to research that. I have actually saved that. I have that as a photo. Um, because I, I still think of, of that um, uh, Mighty Mo for 50 cents. 50 cents. I don't know what year this was, but um, it was amazing. What was really amazing about that was another way that Marriott was, was a pioneer is that they created standardized recipes. One of the things Mr. Marriott used to do was walk through the kitchen with a clipboard, make sure people were following the recipe and the place was clean. I don't know, what, did he ever get you, Steve? I don't know. You weren't in the restaurant at the hotel where he no. So that leads me, so that's kind of my view of the industry, and I, I hope that's useful to you. Are there any questions about that? Anything you want to know more about that I can share with you? Please, yes. You know, I, I haven't seen one for a long, long, long time. Um, you know, certainly you can drive through McDonald's and get a bag of food or, or anything and, and sit in a car and eat it, but I don't, I haven't seen anything. What's interesting is in Washington, D.C., Marriott's actually bringing back the hot shop concept. I have not seen it yet, but I don't think it'll have the drive in part of it. I don't believe, um, I, don't, I don't think so. It's a good question, though. Yes. How do you keep up with the constant change? Jim, would you repeat the question? Yes, I sure will. The question was, how do you keep up with the constant change? Actually, the first question was, are there still drive-in restaurants? And uh, my answer was, no, I don't think so. Um, how do you keep up with the constant change? Um, you, you, you read a lot, you listen to your customers because they know a whole lot more about what they need than we do. Um, you, you, uh, you attend the industry. I mean, we have, we have two people on the mainland now at a, at a conference. We probably send, I don't know, we probably spend 100 days a year with people going to different conferences to learn things. Um, I'm very fortunate myself to, to work with the Kapiolani uh, culinary school, so I see a lot of things there that I might not see otherwise. Um, but the, the biggest answer to that is our customers tell us, and, and we, we just have to learn to, to do that. Um, in our side of the business, uh, packaging and, and variety of things that are available, the quality of some pre-made products is just much, much different than it was many years ago. I remember when frozen french fries were a novelty. I mean, if you get a company like Waihata to carry to inventory frozen french fries, people didn't even know what they were. I mean, they made french fries by cutting a potato, not by taking them out of a freezer. 
So there's a tremendous evolution, and, and every time that every time something like that happens, another another item comes along. In the hotel business, as cost went up, pastry shops started to close. There's very few hotels anymore that have pastry shops, but part of that was because the costs became more. But the other part of it was because new freezing methods, new production methods, made the quality of what was available much better than than it was. Uh, when Mr. Birdseye, uh, Clarence Birdseye, froze something in the um, in an ice river somewhere, I don't remember where it was, but uh, freezing techniques today are different. Production techniques are different. Computers are involved. Quality control is rigid today. Um, so, um, you know, we kind of follow the products, or the products kind of follow the customers. Um, in our in our company, we we don't we don't even recall our salespeople. Salespeople, we call them account managers, because that's what we expect them to do. Our thought, our hope is that we buy things that our customers need rather than try to sell things to them, and it's a little bit different approach. So we we, we just need to listen to that. That's a good question too. Any others? Okay. All right. So why does a distributor exist? Aren't we just the middleman? What do we do? Don't we just add cost? Um, you know, if you think about it, you've got as you come up the street here, you come, you drive from from uh, Honolulu here, you see lots of little stands selling this, that, or the other. Wouldn't it be better if every restaurant just went right to the farmer to get what they needed, or to the rancher, or whatever? Wouldn't that be better? That's the simplest form of supply there could be. But the challenge with that is that no one farmer can supply the restaurant with everything they need. So the restaurant has to go to three or four or five, six, seven farmers. And then one farmer will be out of tomatoes, but the other farmer has them, so they got to switch and go from one farmer to the other. It gets very complicated. Again, in this example, that's the simplest form of supply there could be. But here's what it looks like when you have to run a restaurant or run a hotel or run whatever. All these different lines, and every one of those lines represents a cost. There's a cost of doing business in every one of those lines. So what a distributor does is this. Not quite as simple as the first slide, but not nearly as costly as the second slide. So the reality is our role in this whole thing is to take cost out of the system, not add costs. And so today, we end up with those 16,000 products, give or take, uh, and hopefully every one of them represents a value to one of our customers and something that they can use uh, to, to um, to, to build their business. Um, so finally, I talk about how to select a food supplier. What do you, what do, you do if, if you're in a, I don't know whether, am I recording, I don't know. If you're in a hotel or, and you're, you've got to decide where to find a supplier. First thing you have to understand about the hotel food business is 95% of it is controlled by a corporate entity of some sort. So the individual hotel operator really doesn't have a lot of choice as to where they buy things. Some of them don't really have a lot of choice as to what they buy because the company tells them and they tell them what to use. Um, the, the largest uh, Marriott in um, this was about 12, 13, 14 years ago. Marriott and Hyatt got together and merged their corporate purchasing departments into a single entity called Avendra. And uh, they merged them together, and that merged purchasing department started buying for both properties. And now it includes uh, Club Corp of America, and it includes um, uh, Fairmont Hotels. So there, and now it includes Starwood. Uh, because of the addition, Starwood had their own system. Um, so 95% of the food is, or food 
distribution in hotels is controlled by uh, corporate entities. So you may not have a lot of choice. Um, the, the corporation puts a bid out every three, four, five years and usually goes to the lowest cost provider. And what we find with that, and, and we've been successful with some of them, we're not successful with others, because we're not always the lowest cost provider. And we don't want to always be the lowest cost provider. Um, so what happens is, particularly the upscale hotels, we still enjoy a nice piece of business with them, even though they have a contract for somebody else where they get their rice, their flour, their sugar, the, the basics of, of what they use. Um, and it, it, the, the problem with the, 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 the corporate entities is the courtyard that's up the street is different than the courtyard that's in Waikiki, but it's hard for somebody in Rockville, Maryland to recognize that difference. So it becomes a struggle for the hotel operator. Um, uh, and again, 80% is typically contract, but the hotel usually has the ability to control the other 20% of their purchases. A lot of specialty suppliers, seafood, specialty business, particularly here in Hawaii. Produce is a specialty business, bread, coffee, equipment and supply. So you, you have a broadline supplier. That's what we call ourselves, a broadline supplier, which means, again, we've got 16,000 different things. But we don't do fresh seafood, and we don't do fresh produce. On the mainland, companies like ours do that, but because of the distance and how it has to be handled here, it's become a specialized business. Uh, we're not there. So a hotel today has to have a seafood supplier. They have to have a produce supplier. They have to have a broadline supplier. They probably have to have a bread supplier. We carry a lot of frozen bread. Some of them buy coffee from a different supplier. Um, and then E&S, equipment and supplies, small wares and pots and pans and things like that. Um, so you could have, if you were running the food service in a hotel, you could have as many as six, seven, eight different suppliers that you have to deal with, even though the majority of the product probably comes from one. So that, that's our business. Two entirely different value propositions. I said it earlier. Does the supplier want to sell things or does the supplier want to help the customer buy? And our hope is that we're the latter, not the former. Because, um, again, we should not be the ones who dictate what somebody uses. We need to listen to them and, and help them do what they want to do. So. Um, you know, that's kind of what I put together, and, and um, again, I hope you got some questions. I know some people have to leave in a minute or two for class, uh, but if you have some questions, I'll do my best to answer them. Yes? Um, I'm more interested in, like, your career, and um, I, I guess I was just wondering, you know, knowing what you know now about the industry, if you could start over again, would there be any, uh, would you make any significant decisions, uh, changes in the decisions? You know, I, I think about that from time to time. Uh, I don't think so, but it, it's really interesting when I think back about how certain things happen. I was born into a family that had a business, a wholesale food business. So that's where I started. And it seemed like, I, I'm not sure that every one of the decisions I made was conscious at the time. It was just kind of following the stream. So uh, in retrospect, no. I mean, this industry has been wonderful to me. Um, I, I, I'm very pleased with the choices I made. I'm not sure I would have done anything differently, no. Um, uh, that's an interesting question. Sorry, just a follow-up question. Sure. What would you uh, what 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 would you give like as far as advice goes? What sort of advice would you give to someone who's going into this industry? Into into what part of the industry? Uh, the food and beverage industry. Uh, I, I would say a, a couple of things that they come to mind. First, you got to have a passion for it. But I would argue you have to have a passion for anything you do. Uh, so if if you don't love food. 
don't go in the food and beverage business. I mean, because it's a tough, tough way to make a living. But I would argue that with any business or any side, anything that you go into, follow your dream. Follow, you know, uh, follow what you believe, what your heart's telling you to do. Uh, life's too short to be miserable. You know, so do something you like. Can I close you out, Chad? You certainly may. Ron, you're talking to the